Hey guys, today's random video should hopefully be pretty quick, because I just want to play around with a product that I've seen in the realm of molecular gastronomy, or basically using some basic chemistry to make interesting food products, and that is utilizing a compound called sodium alginate. As its name sort of suggests, it is derived from a type of brown seaweed, or algae. You can also find it produced by a handful of bacterial alginates, but most of them are extracted from types of marine brown algae. As the source Natural Polymeric Biomaterials tells us, sodium alginate is a linear polysaccharide derived of alginic acid and comprised of, you know what, don't worry about this. This is a basic chemistry class. Basically all you need to know is that it's a type of polysaccharide, or a polymeric sugar. As we've kind of talked about before, we can have monomeric sugars like glucose, dimeric sugars like sucrose, and these sugar chains can actually keep getting longer until... Well, we just stop naming them di, tri, quatra, and we just say that they are polysaccharides. Polymeric materials can often have interesting physical or chemical properties, and sodium alginate is no exception. According to NCI thesaurus, you can actually use sodium alginate as a means of blocking intestinal absorption of various radioactive isotopes. However, we're not going to use it like that. So first, let's take a look at the chemical structure of sodium alginate. Obviously, you can see the sodium. So what the heck is an alginate? Well, really, it's just a name we've given to this type of polysaccharide. And you can see by this drawing here, eh, well, again, this is a basic chemistry class. This might be overwhelming some people. You know what? Let's take a look at a three-dimensional model and just get the idea that this is a really crazy but linear chemical structure. Oh, did that make things worse? You know what? We're going to get through this. Keep in mind here that the gray balls are representing carbon, the white are representing hydrogen, and the red are representing oxygen. Those are the only three atoms that we're using to make up this entire molecule. Now right here, we're just looking at a dimeric form of this, but we could have a polymer where this thing stretches on for a couple hundred units at a time. So let's rotate this and see if we can at least identify the monomers, or basically the single repeating units that make up a much larger molecule. Let's take this here, rotate this down, and we can actually see from this view, one, two, three, four, five, six member ring, basically a hexagon with an oxygen in the middle, off to the left, we've got carbon, and then right here, this is a carbon, double bonded to an oxygen, and then an OH group off to the side. If you remember correctly, this is called a carboxylic acid group. So this is basically the generic structure for the monomer that makes up this entire polymeric chain. Let's see if we can find it repeated on the other side of the molecule. Rotate it around here, down, down, and ho, oh, wait, right there, right there. Can you see it? One, two, three, four, five, six. Off to the left, carbon, double bond oxygen, OH. This is the repeating unit joined by this little oxygen right here. See that guy joining the two units? That's what is known as a glycosidic bond, and it repeats itself over and over and over until the polymer effectively becomes unstable. Back in our two-dimensional form, right here is a better representation of a slightly longer polymer of alginates. However, in reality, they're much, much longer. Notice here on the chemical structure though, there actually isn't a hydrogen group on that carboxylic acid I mentioned. That's because as this compound is dried out, it actually loses that hydrogen, this oxygen will pick up an extra electron, making it anionic, thus any sodium nearby is going to act as a stabilizing unit, because it's actually lost one electron, and thus opposite poles attract, right? So what actually happens when we try to dissolve this stuff in water? Well initially, just like salt, some dissociation occurs. The sodium and the anionic alginate actually move apart from one another, stabilized by the polarity of the water. As we continue to add more and more and more alginates, the solution will become a little bit thicker, kind of like adding sugar to water, right? The viscosity increases. Nothing really special occurs unless we start to add some calcium into the mix. Calcium can have an interesting effect on these anionic alginate chains. Because they're about twice as strong as the sodium plus one, the calcium plus two is able to pull the negatively charged spots of two polymers together. With enough calcium ions in solution, the product actually becomes relatively strong, or at least a semi-solid, often referred to as a gel. However, if we think about this in three dimensions, this is actually going to be occurring on all sides. Remember, we're in a liquid, and liquids will take the shape of whatever container they're in. We did it in a cup, it would solidify to the cup, we did it in a bowl to the bowl. But what if we reverse this? What if instead of adding calcium to our alginated solution, we added our alginated solution to a calcium bath, drop by drop? 
Whenever this happens, the coagulation reaction of all, of all our polymer chains coming together will actually occur on the exterior of each droplet, trapping any unreacted liquids inside eventually because that liquid can no longer penetrate the semi-solid gel. And that's pretty much how sodium alginate has been used recently in the culinary realm. You can find them often in boba tea shops or other specialty drink shops as little fruit balls that you can add to your drinks, or in fancier restaurants, they'll even have them as like fake caviar. But my question is, can you do this reaction with any liquid? Well, I have some hypotheses, but if you do too, take a moment, pause this video, and tell me what you think might happen whenever I try this with almond milk, lime juice, wine, some beer that I made for my wedding, I'm pretty proud of it. We called it Hoppily Ever After. <laughs> I know, I'm hilarious. Soy sauce, non-specific brand cola, and water as a control. So here are my hypotheses. I don't think this is gonna work for soy sauce because there's such a high sodium content. Remember, the calcium needs to displace the sodium in order to pull the two alginate chains together. If our solution is really saturated with sodium, this might disrupt that interaction. I also don't think this is going to work for either of the wines or beer. And this is because I know that ethanol is known for destabilizing a lot of polymeric structures. If you look at this article out of the Journal of Science of Food and Agriculture, increasing ethanol content means destabilizing beer foam, and beer foam is also a type of weak polymer. I also don't think this is going to work perfectly with the almond milk, because I think coagulation will occur immediately whenever the alginate is added. And this is because, if you look at the ingredients, tricalcium phosphate is already added in there. That potentially means that the calcium reaction with the alginate is going to occur instantaneously in this media. But let's find out. After incubating for an hour to give some of the foam produced during blending a chance to collapse, I dissolved 5 grams of calcium chloride in 1,000 grams of water to produce a 0.5% solution of calcium chloride. This will act as our reactant bath. To start, I first tried the water. It was impossible to see if any coagulation was occurring as I dripped the alginated water into the calcium bath, but when I strained out the solution, sure enough, there were tiny little water pearls caught by the sieve. I then messed around with making them bigger before moving on to the more interesting solutions. As I hypothesized, no coagulation occurred with the alginated soy sauce. Whether that was because of the excess sodium, or perhaps some other components in the soy sauce reacting with the alginate, I can't be sure. But either way, no soy sauce pearls for my sushi today. I also correctly hypothesized that the beer and wine did not work properly with this method. The white wine behaved similarly to the soy sauce in that, despite the alginate dissolving in the solution, no coagulation occurred. The red wine and beer, however, behaved a little differently. They both coagulated during the incubation period, and I'm not really a fan of beer or wine jello. If I tried this again, I may reverse the process to see if I could actually get it to work with these beverages. Instead of dissolving the alginate in the beer and wine, and then dropping them in a calcium bath, I might actually try dissolving some calcium in them, and then dropping them into an alginated bath. Guess we'll find out later. Surprisingly, the pickle brine and lime juice didn't work either, as no coagulation occurred when dropped into the calcium bath. This makes me think that possibly the low pH of the matrix may be inhibiting the desired reaction. Lastly, I was also wrong on my hypothesis about the almond milk. It actually did form pearls in the salt bath. I feel like these would actually be pretty good with a cold brew coffee on a hot day. But by far, the cola is my favorite. I even got a decent sized one to form without breaking. Well, that's it for this module's random video. Let me know if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'll catch you guys in the kitchen.